funny thing is my first previous jobs, uh, I worked on self-driving. And I was always trying to push Rust because I think it's a much better developer experience than C++. But the answer was always, well, can you certify it? And because at that time, the answer to that question was no. They were like, well, then we can't use Rust in any of the safety critical software that we have. Uh, so today is very exciting to me because uh, the answer to that question now is yes, there's a qualified Rust compiler. Uh, so please give a very warm welcome to the forum. Thank you. This is not staged, but this is a good sales pitch for Rust. <laughs> <laughs> That happens from time to time. I, I, I should just put that on top of the logo, something like that. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll glance uh, at the Rust compiler that we've been talking about for a second in this talk, but mainly I wanted to talk about some things that I think contribute to the success of Rust in general. So preferably if you leave this talk and have a conversation with any of your bosses about why should we use Rust and why is Rust successful, um, you have a couple of few uh, additional quivers, yeah, arrows in your quiver. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Okay, so who am I? I'm Freud, hi. Um, you can send me an email or find me on that new Mastodon thingy. I've been training Rust since 2015. Um, I've been doing Rust since 2013, actually September 29th, 2013, so I've been doing that for uh, 10 years now. I've been part of the core and community team of the Rust project until 2021, and I've been a co-founder of the Rust Foundation as well. Also, because it might be of relevance here, I hold a need on in Kudo if uh, anyone wants to talk about arrows and stuff. Um, I co-founded a business called Fair Systems in 2018 when that training thing became less, a bit more than just a hobby. And currently I would describe us as an open source maintainer company. We're maintaining a lot of parts of the Rust compiler nowadays. We're actually um, one of the biggest contributors to the main Rust compiler next to Huawei and AWS. Um, so what do we do? We do a lot of open source. We do produce Rust Analyzer. Who here uses Rust Analyzer? who is not aware what IDE they're using. Uh, we, we built uh, a tool called Nerling for flashing microcontrollers and interacting with uh, microcontrollers. We um, work on BindGen, and we recently ported sudo to Rust. And for those who are confused why such an offer, uh, effort is useful, we had a security review recently, and we found a bug, and we found that the bug was also in the original. So rewriting things and having them reassessed can actually be useful. We do a lot of training and we do custom development. Um, just quickly, because this is the reason why I'm over, what is Ferrocene? This is one of our biggest products currently. And the reason why I'm over is because it's a Japanese-German co-production. Um, Ferrocene is a high assurances Rust compiler for safety and mission to critical use. That sounds very big. And it's currently on the final legs for TCL3 qualification by ISO 26262. Um, the reason is we found a bug in the documents. Like we found the bug, which pushed out the qualification for until next Wednesday. So it's still in that state. Um, but it is the Rust compiler, as is. So it is 100% um, compatible with upstream Rust. We recently open sourced it. It's literally a downstream. We import all changes of the Rust compiler every day. And, but it comes with additional support and long-term support. Long-term support, in this case, if you put a device out there for 20, 30 years, we're able to give you support for that. And it's particularly built for modern environments, particularly for DevOps settings, in the sense that um, we, we are mindful, like we're not selling you this thing as a per seat thingy, um, if you are a customer that needs that. If you want per seat, we can do that. Um, what is a qualified tool? And I should answer that quickly, because if you never heard what ISO 26262 is, I should explain. Um, a qualified tool is, first of all, the tool itself. But the other question is, what does this tool do? Or what should it do? This is a requirements list. In the case of the Rust compiler, a language specification. 
And famously, the Rust compiler didn't have a uh, Rust didn't have a language specification for a long time. So our long detour was actually doing that and writing a language specification. But then, also, what the standards call a set of evidences that show that these requirements are met. In practice, that means, do you have a test for all of those requirements? The other interesting question is, do you have tests which you have no requirements for? Because then the question is, why are you testing something that you haven't written down what the tool should do? So there's always this effort of, do you actually understand? So the, the big question is, do you understand what your tool should do? And have you tested it? Because this is being deployed in areas where lives are at stake. So you better understand what the thing, the thing should do. Um, I've always described this as, um, so the difference between qualification and just building a thing is you can build a high quality thing, but then someone will ask you, can you tell me why it is high quality? And that's essentially that effort, um, making this more tangible and setting this on feet. Um, actually reading such a standard is very interesting. I'm a little bit sad that they charge you money for that because they're surprisingly pragmatic. They're like, okay, we, we'd like you to prove this. Give us an argument why the things you're doing prove that. Um, they, they're very vague in the sense of you're actually allowed to, do, to apply a lot of methods as long as an assessor later, later says this method is feasible for um, making that case. And that's actually one of the goals of first scene, explore ways to create safety evidence in Rust. Now that we have a language that, for example, is by default memory safe, can we make better arguments that our software is safe? And how tangible are they? Is this just gut feeling, someone posting on Twitter, or is this something where we can actually write a paper on? Um, there are people who write Twitter threads that would very well print out as papers, so just... <laughs> um, but also on, at the same time produce a reusable compiler that fits that end and the other part actually being downstream of Rust Lang Rust. And the interesting thing here is apply the not rocket science rule of software quality to qualification. Who here knows what the no rocket science rule is? This is actually the rule behind the Rust project, which is automatically maintain a repository of code that always passes all tests. So there's a whole talk about how that works in this. Um, so if you've ever looked at how the Rust compiler is built with all of these PRs, reviews, and then Boris trying to merge things into the main line, but testing them first. So the whole rule in Rust is we actually branch off a branch of the main line, run all tests, and if they are green, we're merging them back. That's the not, not rocket science rule at work. And we got that through assessment. So we did not change our production method at all. We just extended it. Okay, that much for the sales pitch. <laughs> what am I speaking about if I'm saying Rust is a high integrity language and why should we base this on that? Um, the word high integrity language has actually been around for quite a while. There uh, used to be a group in I IEEE which was the group for high integrity languages but that was a niche thing. We're talking things like Ada Spark here. Um, the problem, as always in IT, people are throwing things around, uh, but there's no good definition. So this definition is mine. <laughs> um, so from my perspective, a high integrity language safeguards components against misuse. Talk about that in a second. And it reduces and mitigates user mistakes. Um, for example, it reduces action at distance. Action at distance is the idea you change something in this component over there, and the component here breaks. You want to reduce this as much as possible. And it allows for things, for example, like making illegal states irrepresentable. So building data structures that can only be instantiated in legal ways, for example. And for that, it relies on language structure first and foremost, rather than coding patterns. So the language in itself already gives you tools that go pretty far in that. And in general, it enables the safe creation of large and critical software. And that has literally been one of the goals when Rust started out, being the next language for Firefox, which is already a pretty large system, and from certain perspectives also very critical. If you have a security bug in Firefox, it literally impacts billions. Um, so, what solutions do we have for this? Um, I'm at a Rust meetup here, so the small Rust course here, we have ownership, 
Every value has an owner. Ownership can be passed on. Here, this function takes ownership p point. And we have the borrowing rules. Um, so we can take immutable borrows, we can take mutable borrows. The interesting thing about those things is they also express certain kinds of contracts. So these three functions, a function write to file that takes a file structure and a string structure, or the same function that takes a file structure and a borrowed string buffer, or the third one that takes a mutable reference to a file or and, and um, a, an immutable reference to a string buffer have very different behavior, particularly in regards to what are the contracts that the caller enters. Rust is, from a certain perspective, a contract-based language. In the first one, the only contract the caller en enters is, I'm never going to touch these things anymore. In the second one, it says, well, I'm not going to mutate the buffer, and I'm going to keep it around until you're done. And in the third one, it even says, OK, the mutable reference to the file is unique, and I'm going to make sure that it stays this while until you're done. This gets progressively harder to um, keep, especially when we're talking about long distance borrowing, for example, across a thread or across uh, component boundaries. And that's an interesting perspective on Rust that I hear rarely mentioned. Rust is also a very good language at encapsulation, particularly at component boundaries. Um, we can, for example, force a handoff of data between two components. The first variant of calling this function, imagine component A is um, my application and component B, or here called app B, is, for example, a disk I.O. system. The first version here says, Submit everything to the I.O. system. The I.O. system know what it's going to do. The second one says, well, I still have a certain kind of interest in this, and the second and the third. So one interesting perspective on ownership and borrowing are, is that ownership is a very effective tool for decoupling software, and borrowing is actually coupling. And I think this is where a lot of pain around borrowing comes from. It's not the lifetime system. It's actually if you accidentally start borrowing across component boundaries, it becomes really, really annoying. Um, hey, hey. Let's just switch my notifications off. <laughs> so um, these are contracts. And the question behind these contracts is also, which component is currently responsible for this piece of data? Ownership. Um, and borrowing, across, uh, borrowing also means components enter a contract. The, the sender and the receiver enter, enter a contract. Um, the nice thing is that in modern Rust, ownership is actually the dominant concept. Most interesting modeling is done with ownership, which is also the easier concept. But, and ownership enforces strong encapsulation and system cohesion. So Rust is ownership, borrowing, and strong encapsulation. And this sells very well at Java shops. <laughs> <laughs> but much more fundamental question. Why does Rust succeed? Like, literally, why? Um, because inventing programming languages is seriously cheap. So there's someone who collects programming languages for fun, purple.info, and he's listing 9,000. So why is Rust successful? There's also Cyclone, there's all the other ones. Like All of these things have been done before. Because particularly, here's an interesting other paper, Towards Arias Free Pointers. It describes a system of values, references, mutable and unique references, and encapsulation, particularly around um, how that relates to asynchronicity and threads, um, from 1995. So why didn't we get Rust in 1995? The ideas were certainly there. And also, the enforcement in the Rust compiler is not particularly expensive. If someone in 1995 had said, well, Let's implement that. They could have been done by 2000. Um, the problem here is, I think, we often look at programming languages far too much in terms of these features. Um, so we look at programming languages under a microscope, but the macroscope is much more interesting. 
a problem that we have if you want to sell people on a new programming language is we're literally asking them to bring down the house and build new on, on new foundations. At least one of the houses in the street. Not the whole street at once, but at least one of them. So one problem is here any kind of moving the needle approaches will not work. Because if, if we want to get 5% better, probably writing a linter and then linting the whole code base makes much more sense. Um, so why did people in the end end up inventing, investing in Rust? The other question here, let's talk about these high assurance features, high integrity language and all that. Does that mean success? Actually, no. There's another interesting paper, Empirical Analysis of Programming Language Adoption by uh, Majerovic and Rupkin. I highly recommend reading that um, because it goes through a number of language features to figure out which one of them make a language more adoptable or not. So go through like 10 different things. And their conclusion is interesting. Actually, none of them. Program language adoption is a social process. The emotion towards a feature is much more important than any rational view. <laughs> so if your project manager has a gut feeling on a programming language, that's much more important than actually knowledge about that. And the end is also popularity is actually a valid decision-making factor. It's important, and it's the most important one. But the interesting thing is there's two kinds of popularity, which is popularity in breadth. Like, can this thing do everything? This is very much Java, and this is also where Rust is also going. Or does it work well in niches? Um, there's quite a few people that still do Prolog quite successfully. Fortran has its niche in material uh, sciences, uh, to the point where the German government is currently funding uh, Fortran development because no one else is uh, doing it. They recently, um, so Fortran now has a cargo-like Fortran package manager, FPI. Uh, I often joke with my friends that Fortran is more advanced than C at the moment. Yeah. It has an object orientation and all sorts of other things. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, it has a good niche. It's still active, and it's that's certainly not a. Like, there's also the joke is like when when is the uh, when is the time when there were the most Fortran programmers? No. It's actually today. <laughs> so the question is literally, do we have a problem? And in 2013, the, the answer to that was same paper: static typing and correctness were not at all in the value set of the respondents. Uh, the answer was literally no. We have different ones. Um, Let's just go back 10 years. That was the time where we were hyperscaling Ruby, Python, JavaScript, Docker, Kubernetes, all of these kind of things. We were busy with AWS. Um, but today, if you look at Ruby, Ruby has a type system implementation called Sorbet. We have uh, MyPy in Python, JavaScript has TypeScript, and there was this uh, thing around that 50% of JavaScript code nowadays is actually TypeScript, something like that. Um, yeah. And the other thing is, and so actually the whole, stack, uh, the whole deck is stacked against us. Programming language is, uh, adoption is also hard. Um, there's a recent study illustrating a number of mistakes when learning new programming languages. It's also pretty important. I'm the worst person to talk about general programming language learning because I happen to be a programming language fan. I know like 10 of them like halfway, things like that. So, I learned the skill of learning new programming languages, but that's a separate skill. Um, the actual problem here is something called interference, and that's a normal learning concept. Once you learned one way of doing a thing, the next thing actually struggles in your head. But I did it like this in Java. It should be working the same way in Rust. Um, this paper is super interesting. Um, the um, other problem that happens is um, most programming languages are learned opportunistically. It's a fancy way of saying people go on Stack Overflow, say, I want to do X in programming language Y, copy and paste it in their code, and never build a coherent picture. This is actually something that we have in training. A lot of customers nowadays ask us to not do the ownership and train uh, on borrowing part. We always refuse to, to, uh, to skip that because we find problems in just the basic mon uh, mental uh, building that people have around Rust. This is literally this interference problem. People don't learn things from the bottom, which is fine. You go very far with that, but at a certain level, um, retraining makes a lot of sense. So 
again, if programming language learning is hard, why do we adopt new ones? Uh, Oh, uh, did Ada fail? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has all the claim Rust has. Uh, why did it catch up like, from well, the previous one? The important thing is the, the niche one. Ada found its niche, which is aerospace and defense, and, will, and survived very well in that. Ada history is, um, is interesting. Catch me, catch me up over a drink later, because I <laughs> know, know quite a bit about that. Uh, um, but it never got popular. It, be it became popular in its niche, and then C and C++ kind of became more popular in that area. But it also managed to survive that. So it is also good news. Yeah. Um, Rust, interestingly, doesn't come alone. We are currently looking at our tool stacks again. Um, OCaml, if you're currently looking at OCaml Twitter, that's Rust Twitter from 2015. They're very, very <laughs> fun around. D has been an attempt to, uh, to replace C and C++, and their biggest problem was actually their licensing. For a long time, it was uh, proprietarily owned by a company that didn't really want to invest in it. Scala, Kotlin, Zwift, Zig, we're seeing quite a lot of innovation in this area. We are currently living after like 10 years of no one bothering about programming languages, like 2000 to 2013 was really, really a drought. Um, suddenly people are like, okay, maybe we should invest here again. So because there's new needs, there's now new values actually coming up. Correctness is becoming important. Um, talking about D, there's an interesting talk in 2017 by Walter Bright. Uh, Walter Bright is one of the co-creators of the D programming language, and he postulates in this. This is a Q&A, and someone has asked him, "Hey, why do you like? Why such a rigorous push towards memory safety?" And his answer was it, threefold. First of all, the problem of memory safety is already here, but the effect really isn't. Like we are going to see more more bugs. We're just not looking enough, um, and we will have problems once. Like the, the cost of bugs is going up. The more cars we have on the road, the more, uh, the more software we have. This will become a, a, a problem. And particularly, he says, memory safety will become a tool requirement. People will expect you to make a case why you're the thing that you're using, and in this case, the tool is the programming language, why it makes sure that there's no memory safety issues. Because Particularly, we have shown nowadays that it's actually possible to remove memory safety issues out of the equation, at least to a big amount. But the third thing he said is pretty interesting. The pressure for it will not come out of the community. I have a little bit of a problem with that quote. Um, what he means by that, it will not come out of the programmer community. It will come out of legislation. That's also a community. And it's the community that really annoys you once they have their eye on you. Um, and that's an interesting observation. He's basically been saying, like, we haven't taken enough care, but others will make us care. So probably most of you have seen those numbers because they're uh, posted everywhere. Memory, memory safety has become a focus subject at multiple larger companies. Uh, so there's a study by Microsoft, Google, there's an independent study. Uh, there's one from Mozilla, there's an independent study on iOS and macOS about this thing, like 60 to 70% of all Security um, related bugs, particularly zero days, are because of memory safety issues. And we are not getting rid of, rid of them. Can we improve linters? No. Google tried. And if you've seen their recent updates on Google Zero, they said, well, the problem is we're finding more and more of those, and we're attributing it to better checking. Um, so we're finding more and more because we're looking harder, and it doesn't get better. But that's an interesting thing. one. Memory safety is now a term that you can find in the US appropriations bill, which is essentially the, the budget for 2022 uh, or for 2023, um, which said the committee at least was discussing memory safety. There was also a meeting in 2022 in the White House 
can find a report there. I'm going to share the slides later. Um, and a lot of the faces on this report you may know. Chair of the Rust Foundation, lead of the Lang team, things like that. And particularly, they give a, give a number of recommendations. They give three recommendations out of that workshop. Things to look at is memory safe program languages and focusing on how to increase the adoption in open source, software dependency management, all of the SBOM things that you're seeing recently, and behavioral and economic incentives to secure the open source software ecosystem, which is, could we finally think about giving maintainers money? And the supply chain is under scrutiny. As much as I hate citing the Navy, this was from a talk last April um, at a conference of the uh, US Navy. We have 15 years of track record that proves that the current approach to cybersecurity driven by a checklist mentality is wrong and it doesn't work. We will check the tools that are being used to build the software that is being supplied to us. Um, so that was a direct announcement on, okay, we, our suppliers need to change something. The list goes on. <laughs> We're still in 2022. Um, recommendations and customer advocacy. Um, the NSA in its role as the, um, as the advisor for software security to companies in the US um, has uh, strongly recommended moving off from C++. It's the first quote. And the other one is Consumer Reports, which is a customer advocacy uh, group within the US, has likened memory, the memory safety issue to seat belts in cars, missing seat belts in cars, to that change. I think that's, that's very US boasting, but still, uh, they do make a point. And in April 13th this year, um, the CISA and the BSI Germany, which is most relevant for me as I'm from Germany, um, send out a white paper together with a number of other security agencies. Um, the authoring agencies acknowledge that the um, uh, that other memory specific mitigations are helpful for, leg for legacy code bases, but they highly recommend moving off to modern memory safe programming languages, such as a lot of managed ones, C Sharp, Rust, Ruby, Java, Go, and Swift. The one thing that confuses me, as happy as I am as an ex Rubyist, that uh, they always mention Ruby and never Python. I'm confused on why that is. Does Python have an ISO standard? There's beer over here. Let's talk about the Ruby ISO standard later. <laughs> <laughs> because that was a rubber stamp. <laughs> no one ever implemented the Ruby ISO standard. <laughs> the most important words here to look out for are security by design and by default. This is the actual catchphrase. If someone says we want security by design and by default, you sell them Rust. <laughs> this is really like the thing that's going on. Um, and the newest thing, just this month, the Federal Drug Administration in the US will now refuse new medical devices for cybersecurity reasons. Uh, so they are looking at the cybersecurity of those devices. I'm pretty sad that it has taken until this month, but still, this is, uh, so this topic is under scrutiny. And that's actually a big push for us. Memory safety is becoming more than a technical concern. It is becoming something that your program manager or even like your C-level may slowly hear about. What are they saying when they're talking about the safety by design? Are we using safety by design tools? Are we using safety by default tools? Something like that. And then you can flip out the paper and say, oh, by the way, there's Rust on this list. Um, and Rust has been, and this was something that we moved towards, become kind of the synonym for that. And that's actually a force multiplier. You can only do that if you're actually delivering. So this is not like in any way um, saying like the technical details don't matter. You can only do that if the technical details are actually in order. Um, because um, the people who will make the final decisions will put these claims under scrutiny. And the other thing that we're seeing, I've been talking about the safety qualification. Um, I think the safety thing will go away or, or merge with problems that we already have. Um, many safety critical systems, our cars and all of this become connected and for example being supplied with over the air updates. There's always now, there's back end systems, there's front end systems, the front end system happens to be your engine. Um, long update cycles really become infeasible. It used to be that, okay, the hardware, no one's gonna touch it, but recently there was this fun hack of we're hacking a car through its front lights because someone put a CAN bus in there. 
and didn't secure it because who's going to hack the front lights? Well, the first one who figures out. Um, so this is actually quite fun for me who used to operate data centers and run, run websites. It's like that was often not seen as real engineering, but the one thing you learn is you're under attack 24 seven by, by automated bots. It's not, they, they not even care about your website. They're just looking for common bugs. And that means the discussion about fundamentally new tools is open again. So last year I was at a conference. There was a company that was like, okay, we're sure that Rust will come. We're looking for the right, right moment to invest in it. And six months later, they got in touch with us and were like, uh, wow, yeah, now's the moment. <laughs> so these things are moving fast. And Rust is also a, a statement about how Compilers are not just compilers, but also the tools around. So it comes with everything that is expected. It comes with Cargo, Clippy, and so on and so forth. This more made the whole qualification very easy. We did the qualification on a budget where people were like, how did you manage that? <laughs> um, and way under time. Um, and all of these things, when they're released together, the advantage that we release all tools together, they make it a targetable environment that you can um, so a Rust 164 is not just Rust 164. It is also the cargo that shipped with 164 and all of these kind of things. So it's it, not too many things change. Um, that. Um, and Rust comes out of a DevOps culture. This is the interesting bit that a lot of people are missing. Like uh, the compiler testing of the Rust compiler is actually top class for all compilers. It's literally the level one. It's better than LLVM. Most compilers actually don't even have automated testing in their main repositories. Um, we've kind of managed to figure that out. So the answer to why is Rust successful is, first of all, it's a product of a wave of change. It was at the right time. It did not produce the wave, and I think that's important to appreciate, but it rides at. And if you're writing that, we are in a good feedback loop um, because technology influences the message, message influences technology. And Rust is a synonym for memory safe programming language. The other thing is previously separated industries glow, uh, grow together and that creates a friction where new products can be adopted. And well, values and requirements are changing. So the most important question if you talk to anyone about this is do we even have a problem? Do we appreciate that we're having a problem? And one of the things that we did very effectively in the community team back then, if the answer was, if, if we asked people that problem, like, do you feel you have a problem? And people said, no, we're doing fine with C and C++. Okay, Don't, stop talking. There's no way past this. <laughs> the emotion towards the problem <laughs> is as important as anything else. If yes, then it's actually the right moment to get started gradually. This is the other mistake that we see in a lot of companies is like waiting for too long and then suddenly trying to, 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 to put a group of 30 people onto Rust. And also appreciate that Rust is one of the answers to this question. How do we deal with memory safety? Um, in other environments, other languages or other products may just be the better answer. And yeah, thank you for that. Well, thank you. That was a very insightful presentation. Thank you. Good to see all this, these changes. Uh, so now I'm going to ask you a little bit about your background. Uh, how did you get into computing and programming? I've, I've, my parents, both of my parents are programmers. <laughs> it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of programming do they do? My mother did Fortran and COBOL. My father was more of a sysadmin. Um, so all that kind of stuff, and I, I, I took the boring route. I do the same thing as my parents. <laughs> do you have any siblings? Yeah, a Are brother. Also programmers. Uh, this is a uh, this is also a family company. Like my brother is actually the, the second co-founder of the company. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I could catch that. <laughs> he's he's doing the off stuff. <laughs> uh, so the next question is, uh, what kind of uh, languages did you use before Rust? Uh, mostly Ruby. Um, so um, I was part of the German Ruby community for a while. Um, so some of you may, may know that I run the European Rust conferences. Before that, I was running the European Ruby conferences. Um, that was a, 
around 2005 to 2018, something like that. My first company that actually um, gave me the opportunity to form Ferris Systems was actually Ruby Shop, but not a Rails shop. Actually, we did a lot of Popper, Chef, backend stuff. Um, yeah, so. It sounds like a, a big sort of step function like change to go from Ruby to Rust. How did that happen? How did you get into Rust? Um, <laughs> friends. There was a certain <laughs> Steve Klamnik very interested in Rust and oh. yeah. I mean, I switched over to 2013. Like, I, I, looked, I looked a lot at pro other programming languages but rarely used them productively. I did a little bit of Python, a little bit of Haskell, all of these. Um, and the nice thing about Rust was this was developed out in the open even when it was in research phase. So for someone who just wanted to look at how programming languages were developed in 2013, I had my two years of just fun hanging around mailing lists. So then it actually went somewhere. <laughs> Pretty cool. Uh, so you never use C or C++ before moving to Rust? Uh, unless forced to. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually my most popular Ruby patch is still one written in C, but yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go out on live here and guess that uh, since Steve Klabnik got you into the, the Rust community as well, that's how you become, became involved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, it was actually he hired me for the community team in a sense. So the, the, the first community team he set up, he sent out very selected questions to people he knew that already had experience in doing this kind of stuff. I hope you all are taking notes. It's all about the community. You know, yeah. Meetups make Rust happen. We're glad to. <laughs> so what was uh, the most difficult thing about Rust for you to learn? <laughs> That's a naughty question. The problem is, um, I, I always joke that I didn't learn Rust in the sense. I learned Rust 08, which had <laughs> a garbage collector, uh, an async runtime, a parallel runtime, all of these kind of things. Um, so. I had these two years of actually following Rust towards 1.0, so I still sometimes have problems in the sense of, wasn't the default for integers something else? Um, <laughs> this whole interference problem. Um, I have that with Rust pre-1.0. <laughs> so my, my hardest bit was actually building the compiler every day and figuring out what broke. <laughs> um, because it's a, before a language gets stable, it's incredibly volatile. There was a phase where Rust had interfaces and classes. So whenever someone asks, it's like, well, why doesn't Rust have interfaces and classes? Well, it was tried. It didn't really work. Um, it was very inconvenient or not quite fitting where they wanted to go. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I hear that answer. Uh, my last question is, if you were to give advice about what kind of... Uh, topic the next presenter should take on? What would that be? What is exciting for you? I, I'm, I'm not in the business of giving advice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like people talking about the stuff that they find interesting. Um, in general, um, I always found it useful that to understand is like most people in the room probably don't know about the stuff that you're doing. So. Um, dumbing down is the wrong word. It's like making your talk as simple as possible. Um, because I, 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 I share a piece of experience there. I trained the servo render team. And multiple people there are on the Rust compiler team. And I was like, what should I do there? Turns out they know zero about async and network programming, uh, which I, as operating a data center <laughs> for some time, just happened to know a lot about. Um, so that was a very interesting training where we were exchanging things about like how do render engine uh, how do render engines work and how do network <laughs> does networking work. This is actually a pretty broad bit of things that are applicable everywhere. And then there's this twenty percent where it goes really deep into your subject matter. That was really interesting. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you for joining us tonight and telling us about Ferrocene. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Enjoy your stay in Tokyo. I will.